Okay. I am trying to do something different. This video you might not want to watch, but I have to make a lecture for the Korea Banking Institute. I have to tell you a story that I went there before and it didn't work out very well because I didn't use PowerPoint slides. So what I have tried to do, and I think it might be worthwhile, and I'm kind of practicing with this video, is to go through and discuss the various slides. Sorry, I can't even get anything out of my mouth today. So hopefully people can write down something. So I'm posting this set of slides. Now, I've, I've redone a whole bunch of slides. I used to have it all messed up and there was no real structure and there was no organization. This business of a fast modeling standard FAST, maybe that should be applied to your life where you're flexible but structured. Those are conflicting uh, kind of objectives. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm trying to do this. Now what I'm doing here, trying to do this, I'm trying to show you the slides. It's going to have a lot of modeling in it. So, But the main thing is the implications of the modeling and how you use the modeling. So no Excel at all. And uh, I'm going to review the essence of really project financing and show you how I think you should look at it. I want to go through the bank perspective in project financing and how to interpret LLCRs and all that. How you can create or destroy value through contract provisions. I'm going to try to do this all fairly quickly and then I'm going to try to go through some debt sizing, debt funding, repayment, interest, credit enhancements, and some other subjects, including uh, how you sell a project at different times and get benefits from uh, uh, the change in risk over the, the life of the project. So the, in part one, I'm just trying to review the basic ideas of project finance and just how we discuss this. I think, you know, to put the, in, I read these, these definitions, I read these books, I read, ah, oh, this horrible, stupid definitions. The basic thing about project finance is there's no history. In corporate finance, I've done a lot of corporate finance, and you focus immensely on the history. In project finance, the bank is so important. If there is no financing, there's no project. If the bank doesn't put a stamp on your passport that says you can do this, it's nothing. Financing may be important, but you do DCF valuations and all that in, in uh, 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 corporate finance. In project finance, if you have things go okay, you pay off the debt. In, in corporate finance, and here's what I have to do, uh, oh, no, 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 no. And they are supposed to continue growing and refinancing the debt. Mm, I think I can, I have an extra line here, so that's what I'm going to do as I kind of go through this in a, a, a project finance, equity, IR, DSCR, PE ratios, all that in corporate finance. And then I've shown you this before, but I think a project philosophically is like a, 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 a business in a city. A city is like a, a corporation. It continues. Detroit is bankrupt, but it's still on the map. These businesses might all go away one day. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through my theory that project finance is like a relationship where you have a dating period, development period, a financial close, uh, 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 which is your engagement, and then your construction period before you get married, you're getting ready to get married, and then your commercial operation date, and then refinancing, and you have to sign a contract called a marriage agreement. Enough, I just did that. But it's a family. It's kind of like a corporation. It just goes up and down and up and down. It lasts indefinitely. There's a lot of history. Project finance is one little person in this family who dies and is born. Okay? You need to understand that's the real definition. Now, if we're going to do a 
project finance, I think this idea, I used to not want to do this, but this idea of putting these diagrams is worthwhile, but they're so crappy sometimes, they lose their meaning. You know, the SPV, of course, is all the middle, the contracts are the, are, are, are the lines, and the contract should be labeled, hopefully, and the contract should be consistent, and I think you should show the direction of where the money is going. So before we do this, I just think there are three fundamental types of projects, ones with price risk, that you can get a handle on because you've got some history. LNG, oil, mining, petrochemical, refining, volume risk, that's a whole lot harder because it's almost always traffic risk, toll roads, seaports, and all that. And then there's availability risk, which is really political risk. Okay, it really boils down often to political risk. Uh, sorry about this. Okay, this is slowing me down perhaps a little bit, but what the heck, you know, some people say I'm an idiot for, for doing this for nothing. Oh, well, nobody really watches this anyway. The, the, you know, here's some price risks examples. And this is, and to understand really, you know, how a price bubble, is a price bubble really occurring? And what is a price bubble? Or do you have long-term differences between marginal cost and what the true, the price and the marginal cost? So the first example I'm going to use is this Russ Lafon. You know, they have the highest GDP per capita because they did a project finance. Put the contract up here. They got it. Korea and Japan. It was really Korea Ah, come on, uh, Korea Gas to, to, to uh, sign an offtake contract. So they were going to get money. It's at the oil price. There's price risk. They signed an EPC contract, and these contractors, I should know a little bit who they are. I'll have to look up that Kellogg. They're supposed to be good contractors. Not only a good EPC contract, but a good uh, a, a, a contractor. And then they had supply agreements, and the supply agreements are so important to understand. You really should look, perhaps I should have put a supply curve here, really. And then we have a shareholders agreement. The thing that was so good here is they brought in Mobile Oil to be one of the shareholders, and that gives the project credibility. Now, there we could draw a, a line around this right here, We'd start here and draw a line. That would be the, the ring fencings. The lenders and the shareholders are outside, but having a good shareholders really works. And then this project got a single A, a minus, which is a lot better than the risk of the country, and the rest is history. Every mistake was made by Eurotunnel. Now here, to understand Eurotunnel, if you try to make one of these diagrams, and don't distinguish between what happens before the financial close and what happens after the financial close. You've got nothing. That's really such a key component uh, of development through... I don't need this bracket here, do I? Okay, and then here's what I do. I said, okay, let's look at what happened to this project before development, before, before, before the uh, uh, financial close. And they had a, some offtake contracts. They did. It. They paid some development costs to make a big RFP. They won the RFP. The contractor was TML, Transmarch Link. I think. I hope I got that right. And they owned most of the project. But they also were the EPC contractor. So there's this story that, you know, the president of of Eurotunnel was from TML, and he went and signed the contract. And this is all before financial close. And then the lenders were also kind of some of the shareholders, and they made some commitments, and they wanted to do the loan. Oh, great. But then after financial close, that's when it fell apart. First of all, we really start this EPC contract was absolutely horrible. It was supposed to be fixed price. It was nothing like that at all. There were immense cost overruns. TML wasn't the shareholder anymore because they went and made an initial public offering. So the sponsor was a bunch of shareholders, a weak sponsor. And this uh, uh, project itself, I should have put here, we should, maybe I have to put that right here again. This project 
had unconventional, not conventional technology. So they, all of these mistakes, bad sponsor, bad contract, bad uh, uh, non-conventional technology. The lenders tried to rely on the debt to capital ratio. They wanted to show that skin was put in the game by these uh, 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 sponsors, but the sponsors were kind of idiots. They were just shareholders and they relied on some fraudulent uh, uh, um, uh, uh, prospectus. And then the traffic study was just crazy. Let's look at that. Here's the traffic study. Here's, if you just look at the very beginning, they were off by a factor of two, and then it was supposed to go up, and that's how they were going to make their IRR and pay off the debt. So, of course, they didn't pay off the debt. And this traffic studies, this volume risk compared to price risk, has been so dangerous because we can't come up with downsides. Here's, if you're here, are a bunch of toll roads, that there was a wonderful study that you can uh, put, on, I put on a Google Drive at least, it's an old one, but it shows what the actual compared to the forecast was. If you're right at forecast, you'd be 100%. Some of these ones were 30%. What, you have to reduce the, the, the forecast by 70%? And then I just said, well, when we do this kind of stuff, I think this is how you set up the diagrams. And when you set up the diagrams, you know, you, I said, oh, the best thing we need is a bad thing is not to have a good sponsor. When we went to the uh, uh, Russ Lafon, we had this really good sponsor named Mobile, who's now Exxon Mobile. Ah, oh, so good. But then we have a counterexample, of course. Motorola did this telecom study, and all these people, wonderful. Solomon Smith, Barney, oh, they, all the Lehman Brothers, they were considered so good. They projected all these amounts, and here's what actually happened. I saw somebody with an iridium on his shirt yesterday in Amsterdam. Now, the, the, uh, 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 let me just tell you, oh God, I, I click these ones. Oh, here's the equity, the sponsor, input. They don't put what contracts they are. Oh, they have the output, e.g., an offtake agreement. Here's what, but this, you want to be able to assess who is in the box and assess the contract. And you better understand where the money is coming from and where it's going. This is kind of even worse, the finance. and So these are examples of silly ones and toll roads. This is the only risk, really. Not tolls, it's traffic. Unless it's a, a availability project, which I have here, and I always use a hospital example. Imagine a hospital where the the, the product where you get paid depending on how many patients you have. Then you really, really hope for sick people. That's, you want Ebola more than anything else. Sorry to say that. I don't want to insult anybody. But that's what you want. And then, but the government, maybe if they decide how many hospitals to build and where to build them, then it makes a lot more sense, perhaps, to use some kind of availability structure where if you don't have a machine that's working or if you don't clean the floors, if people slip on the floors, if there's dirt all over the place, then you should get penalized. And if you do a really good job, you should get a bonus. Nothing to do with how many patients you have. That would be an availability. And you get a fixed payment. And electricity plants or the capacity payment are ex exactly the same thing. Now, when you do this, the, the contract is a lot more complicated. And it, there's a, you can argue, the argument between merchant projects and uh, in electricity and, a, and PPA projects is really an argument about this. If the government decides where to build and what kind of build, then you should you know, make these complicated projects. You could say, oh, no, the government's not going to do this. We should have a private company decide where to build these projects and how to build and what type and whether they're, they're gas or solar and anything else. And then we'll get the right mix of capacity and the government won't be stuck with its idiotic decisions. That's your pure economic, your pure believers in, in things. I'm not saying I'm on either side, but the problem is if you impose all these risks, you're eventually going to pay a higher cost of capital. And, you know, does the cost of capital really get transferred to the government or not? That's the, the ultimate theory. 
So now I'm going to go to the back perspective a little bit. I hope this, this structure makes a little more sense than some of my other slides. Now I just define DSCR. If you define PLCR, DSCR is CFADS divided by debt service. I need to go quickly. PLCR is, is the same thing, but we put PVs around it. LLCR is a very similar thing. Uh, but we, uh, 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 can I, I'm going to, I am sorry about this, but I want to see if I can make some of this stuff. No, I can't get it on one page, really. No, well, maybe I'll leave it like that. Okay. Uh, LLCR is the same thing, but we do it over the loan life. And the fundamental formula you really need is, oh, no, is, is that the, Debt at the COD is equal to the PV of the debt service. I'm doing this while I talk. Then you can say PLCR is debt divided by debt. And then DSRA is that, that's like net debt. Because DSRA is just cash. It's just like we do in corporate finance. Maybe I should put a little bracket around those two. Excuse me for, for doing this. But, you know, I'm not charging anything for this. If I, if anybody actually, <laughs> that's never going to happen. If I ever figure out how to monetize any of this, maybe I won't do these kind of fixes in it then. Okay, and the theory is that the DSCR measures the PD, the probability of default in one single year. LLCR, it's, you've already defaulted, but it measures the coverage on, over the loan, if, even if you have to restructure some of the debt. PLCR says, oh no, we got to go to the whole life. Then, you know, if you start on the bottom here, this says we have full sculpting, we'll talk about later, and we have no tail. The tail is the stuff down here. So I'm trying to do this to define these things. In that case, the DSCR and the, you notice it gets wider as it goes up, but the DSCR is equal to the PLCR. The area is the same as the year by year, and the minimum is the same as the last year. Then the LLCR is the same thing too, because we have no tail. If you have the same thing except put in a tail, the PLCR will be bigger and it will measure the value of the tail. If you don't have sculpting, then you have a wider <coughs> buffer over time, and the DSCR is less than the LLCR, which is less than the PLCR. Okay, enough. Then, just to review, in corporate finance, I kind of showed you some of this before. Maybe I should move the slide around. But we have DSCR, PLCR, and we don't look at debt to EBITDA as much. Debt to capital we use differently. You need liquidity with a debt service reserve account. If you're going to look at, this should say return on uh, equity and return on invested capital. I'll fix that later. Okay, and the big thing here is I want to go through the fact that if you have like a hundred, if the D, if the, the 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 cash flow is one hundred and fifty, and the, the the debt service is one hundred, so we have a DSCR of one point five, then the cash flow you can say, well, how much can the fat cash flow go down before you don't repay your debt? That's break even. That's the benefit of the stuff. That's the benefit of DSCR. How low can your cash flow, how much buffer do you have before you miss the plane? How much buffer do you have if you're going to read the Google Maps wrong? How much buffer do you have if you're, I don't know, I'm obviously thinking too much of traveling because I, I, I'm always in economy class on these planes, but that's what we have. Now, we can do exactly the same thing and say, what's, the, and you have to, you can't just say, if the DSCR is 50%, that's not the cash flow reduction. It's, 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 it's the 50 divided by the 150, that would be the 30%. Same thing, you could do the same thing with LLCR. That says, how low can the cash flow go before we can't get paid? And the PLCR, kind of the same thing. And then, here's what you can do. You can then take history, and what I'm trying to do here is I've got a few different commodity price files. I've got to update the uh, uh, Google Drive a little bit, but then you can look at the history. That's why commodity prices in Ras Lafon was okay. You can measure the break-even price 
basically with these DSCRs. And not quite, you have to put some fixed costs in. But basically, that's the idea. Okay? And that's the idea of a DSCR, really. That's what you're looking at. And you can go the other way and see. If we're going to change something, how much can we, if we, re if we have an availability payment that reduces our EBITDA by 20%, you could say 1 minus 0 0.2 is, is 0.8. 1 divided by 0.8 is how much we need as a DSCR. Okay? And then we can, uh, then here's what I want to show you. When you look at DSCRs, you're really saying, what kind of DSCR do we get to get kind of a low average? We don't want to be AAA. These are uh, monoline insured things, so forget those. We don't want to be really bad because then we pay a whole too much of a credit spread. We, this is our target. And when we look at different risks with different kind of targets, this is ancient. I don't know if it's right or not. But, you know, you ask the bank and they tell you what the DSCR is. And DSCR should be different because we have different risks. These risks or the toll road risks or the price risks. But when we compute these DSCRs that we really need, the bank is really telling you, um, you know, what kind of buffer you, you need to become a triple B. That's really what's going on in the theory of project finance. So that's kind of basic uh, things. Now, I think and, uh, a man named Sajed from, uh, he lives in Paris. He's originally from Iran. He's brilliant. He said, forget all this crap. Just look at the project IRR. If somebody's telling you you have a really high project IRR, how can you believe these idiots? How can you believe that other people won't come in and do the same sort of thing? How could you believe that the government would be stupid enough to sign a high-priced contract with a high project IRR and not figure it out one day and change this contract? And if you have a high project IRR in a commodity price, are they giving you real numbers? Or maybe you have a competitive advantage. But that's kind of looking at the real cost structure. Sorry, I get very excited about this one. Then now I move to, from just the basic contracts to some of these contract provisions. They're kind of more relevant in, in uh, availability projects than anything else. Okay, and I, you can begin with a PPA contract. It's the same as a, 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 a whatever. PPP, purchase price. No, 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 no. PPP, I mean a, a public-private partnership. And this idea of back-to-back -back contracts and the idea of having a fixed-price contract that corresponds to the availability contract. That's the problem with Euro Tunnel again. And what we'll do is to figure out how to transfer all these risks, and then you leave the, the SPV insulated. And the idea is you use these tariffs with different parts to, 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 to give you a fixed and variable, your variable costs, or if they go up, they're, they, they're covered by a variable charge that goes up, and you have some bonuses and penalties. And here, I, what I try to do is put a little example. And the company says, ah, the off-taker will suffer damages due to a failure of the country, uh, uh, the, the, the company, and if it doesn't achieve COD on the scheduled date, and then if they don't, they're going to have to pay some, I have to disguise this, some amount per megawatt per day. And then you have an EPC contract that mirrors this one. And that says liquidated damage will cover any of the pro it will cover the amount payable under the project documents PPA why don't they just call this PPA or whatever concession agreement or whatever and also the amount restored to get the DSCR to where it was back cuz there's more interest during construction and then there's a limit on the liquidated damage and you can do the same thing for O&M risk you know if the if the O&M people don't uh, maintain the plant, then it'll fall apart. It'll get less efficient, less available, and everything else. It's, it may be a hospital, the same kind of thing. So you better, 
when you make your O&M contract, you better give them an incentive to have that availability and that efficiency pretty good. And so here's what you do. I think you start and you put all this contract down here. I think I should have made this go the other way. Oh no, I was kind of inconsistent with what I just said. Uh, no, I better fix that one. So this is our big contract. I better put this kind of uh, underneath there too, you know. So I'm going to make this a really big line as I, I've been doing. And I'm going to uh, 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 make this red or something like that. Okay. Did I just do that? And then I'm going to also uh, put this to the back. Okay. So we can kind of see what we did. So we're really talking about now what's... Uh, this is the big contract. This is where it all comes from. And it has these different tariff provisions and penalties. And all the rest of the contracts better be consistent with this contract. Okay, and there's a... So we have an O&M contractor who should guarantee a heat rate. A fuel supplier should correspond to the fuel supply provision. The, uh, and so on and so forth. Enough. And here's an example of an O&M contract, I don't know. So if, if there are liquidated damages and you figure out how many lost revenues you have from availability penalties or something and you impose that on this, the interesting part to me, and I could go on for months about this, is that there must be some cost to make the availability more secure. There, you could even build two things. Like when I go on a plane, I like to see two engines instead of one sometimes. That's building redundancy. That's increasing the availability by a lot. And then if you increase the availability, you should figure out what's the just the optimal point. Because the availability cost goes up, but the, the, the cost to the off-taker, well, that goes up if the availability is worse. So you can just add these two lines together and see what the minimum point is and that's what you should use in the penalty provisions. And coming up with really how to do that I think is a fascinating thing. And then you can look at this whole thing in a different way. You can say, well, if I'm going to impose a charge and a, a penalty on this contract and if I'm going to impose penalties on this contract, nobody's going to do it for free. Nobody's going to do it for free. The EPC contractor wants profits. The O&M contractor wants profit. The developer takes a whole big risk. They want profits. The equity holder wants an IRR. Debt holder wants a profit too. Everybody wants a profit except the off-taker who has to pay the money. So that's why I keep emphasizing this is a different way to do it. A real way to think about this is how are we... Uh, um, are, how are you being paid for taking risks? Is the EPC profit too high for taking its risks? If it's a solar project, there aren't many risks in that anymore. You just plop a couple of things in the ground. If it's a nuclear plant, I think there are a lot more risks. And how, how much do you pay to offset those risks? And the off-taker ultimately has to pay. And if you pay these people too much, or these people too much, or these, or even the poor old bankers too much, then you can lose the bid or overpay or lose the IRR over here. It's really kind of putting everything together. So here's what I did next. I did a case study, and I love this part of the Harvard business. I think I won't get in trouble for doing this. Oh, their company, Enron, the development arm, had a, they wanted to enter the huge Indian market. Enron Development Company was headed by Rebecca Mark, a MBA from Harvard. Its youthful, energetic president and CEO. Look up her on LinkedIn. She's pretty smart, I think. She summed up her ph philosophy. We're electric bunch. We bought missionary zeal. It demands so much of your attention that I think you have to do, it's three parts. We are, oh, we do these that are good for the country. Aha, and we're environmentally safe. And the best thing, we are bringing a market mentality and spreading the privatization gospel. How could I not clip that? What, it's one of the best 
clips. There's Rebecca Mark. She's spreading the privatization gospel to some man from India. There's this bubble plant. And here it was has the perfect structure. It had all these things. And Enron was the part of the contractor. Enron was the O&M. Enron did the fuel management. Enron got an IRR. You can't figure out how much Enron was getting unless you look at all this stuff. And these contractors are so good. And here's a, another example, really. I, this, I, put, I tried to put in red where Enron really was. The key thing, they weren't here. They weren't paying the money. And I should make this another... Uh, uh, yeah, no, I'm going to do that. I am so sorry about this. But, but you might get mad. But you're not paying for it anyway, you know? You know, people say these, uh, whatever. So I'm going to make this go down like this. Whoops, oh, shoot. Where's my arrow? Okay, obviously I'm not very good at the PowerPoint stuff. And, oh, no, it's diagonally. It's got to be, oh, maybe I should leave it diagonally because it was such a mess. This is another wonderful project. So I tried to make the Ross Lafon about an oil uh, you, you know, about a, 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 uh, uh, the Ross Lafon was about a, uh, oil, a, a price project. Let's make this really, 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 really big. Okay, that's where they got the money. That's the key. That one is a different direction than the other ones. And if you make these stupid things, these they're not that stupid, but if you make these diagrams, if you don't see where the money is coming from, you don't get anything. And here's the best part of it. They went to the Academy Awards or something. <laughs> this picture was so... They look at this Project Finance International. Look at this. They all could, took a trip to London, stayed at some really nice hotel, and then somebody up here is getting an award for having the best structured project. And they're saying, I thank my mother and my secretary and everybody. But here's what really you didn't do. This looked to be such a perfectly structured project. And there's Rebecca Mark again. But the IRR was 22%. You get this straight from the, from the Harvard business case. They didn't put it in there, the idiots. Sorry. You put project IRR first, and when you get 22% IRR, you think, why is the government of India going to be that stupid to, to keep that going, or can they even afford it? And that was the biggest thing. Don't look at any of these things. If, you can't, if the off-taker can't afford it, I don't care how many state guarantees, federal guarantees, or anything else. If they can't afford it, it's not going to work. And the, the rate increase when I computed this, it was about 38%. 38%. Or uh, maybe 48%. I'm not sure. But when you have that, it's not going to work. And when you pay way too much and you don't benchmark, this project doesn't look that much different than any other combined cycle projects. Why should it cost two or three times as much? That's enough. You don't have to go through these cases in a really long term to see that. Okay? We can. I'm sure some. Pe I I got some people angry a lot at me already, but that's okay. What? Who cares? I'm getting old. And now I'm going to move to project finance, the structuring, the loan structuring. But I'm going to do that in part two, because right now the video is already about 33 uh, minutes long. Okay.